the first few smiles, you know, you're like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm such a terrible person. I should not be smiling. No, my mom died. My mom died. No, like, no, I'm in darkness. This is horrible. I miss her. It's heavy. But the problem is that grief is forever. I mean, you love that person for the rest of your life. You're going to grieve forever, just at different levels of, of intensity. Julie, thank you. I guess we're technically live right now. So I want to thank you for for jumping on here. And um, thank you for you know, having I, me. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Thank you. It's, it's a real honor. And I, I love what you're doing. And I would love for people, I would love for you to introduce yourself however you maybe normally would if there is a normal. And just so people <laughs> kind of understand a little bit more about your your page and whatnot and where your page is inspired from. And then I feel like we can go in from there. Yeah. Um, so my name is Julie, Julie Barsman. I grew up in France, um, born and raised, and I moved to Los Angeles when I was 18 and um, did my little crazy life out here and then um, eventually met my fiance and became a mother. And uh, within that, um, him and I lost our mothers. Now it's going to be about seven years. And, um, my page that I started is a blog. It's called the mommy codes. And it was inspired by starting motherhood into just a really difficult way from the grieving aspect of my mom. And then also the lack of postpartum, um, help that there is in America. That's really different from France. And so I just really wanted to be honest and raw and bring on like the real truth of motherhood and still be cute and just you know kind of like quiet down the do's and don'ts but make it like in my own humor kind of like what you were saying also about your podcast where it's like some serious things and painful things can also be brought into like a respectful way but like it's okay we can talk about it let's have a little bit more ease into all of this. So that's why I created my blog. And, um, at first it was just about postpartum toddlerhood, crazy moments. And then I had a pregnancy journey that, um, didn't quite go well and more grief came into the picture. And now my page is really dedicated to, um, helping mothers through conceiving, through loss, through, um, I want to say like silent motherhood, if they went through a miscarriage or a stillbirth, like in my case, um, and just really bring a part of, uh, of grieving into that's just, I don't know, that shows that we can survive in some ways, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you have to nail that. I think you know exactly what you're doing. So don't say, I don't know. <laughs> you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, but would you mind uh, just explaining, you know, uh, for anyone that, I, I mean, I think this is going to obviously attract a specific audience and I hope it does because once again, what you're doing is, um, you know, I, I, I've said this before on other podcasts or in other situations, I don't like putting a hierarchy on loss because, you know, everyone mm -hmm. experiences in different ways, but losing a child is just a whole nother thing. So can you explain yeah. what, what exactly stillbirth is? Yes. So a stillbirth um, is a late term pregnancy loss. Um, so it's after the three months and usually it's around, you know, like uh, I think it's five months to nine months and um, it's very sudden and stillbirth is, the baby unfortunately passing inside the womb. Um, and there's 50% of cases that are undiagnosed and there's no reasons for it. And then there's other um, cases where it can be like a cord accident or placenta issues and different things that mothers can sometimes pinpoint what happened. But most of the time it's unfortunately... Um, kind of a mystery. Yeah. I mean, how does that, if there's so many aspects of it that I want to dive into, but the fact that such a high percentage is, you know, a, a mystery, mm -hmm. what, does that, does that, what does that add to the already tragic event in a sense of like not having an answer to it or 
a thought that whether it could be prevented or not, which it seems like it can't be, but does that have an effect on the grieving process? The fact that it is a mystery? Yes, I think it really, really does. Um, not only, I think there's a pressure already in mothers when they're pregnant with or without grief of how healthy they are. You know, what do you eat? What are you exercising? What are you doing? How healthy are you? What products are you using? There's a lot of weight on that. And so I think there's a lot of guilt that can come with that grief um, because you might think it's your fault, but most of the time it really isn't. And um, so there's that weight of like, yeah, of course, not knowing. It's like, like how, like how can that happen? And unfortunately it's not talked about. I didn't know anything about stillbirth before that. And I already had my motherhood blog. Um, so it definitely makes you, it's one of those things where you really wonder why it happened and the closure. I don't know if you ever get a closure with something like that, but the healing process, um, is difficult. You really have to not allow yourself to feel guilt because of not knowing. Right. Yeah. I don't know. How, I mean, how do you, how did you work through that? Is it just understanding it objectively that, it, that you can't do anything? You know what I mean? Cause I feel like there's some cases of survivor's guilt and so many different other aspects of death that, you know, is, it makes, I could understand why someone may have that guilt. But then when you look at the other side, it's like, what the, I just made a post a second ago before all this about how accepting the things you can and cannot change. And it's such mm -hmm. a cliche thing, but I think it's so vital to certain situations that maybe apply to what you experienced. So how did you, how did you get past that? Um, so I think there's like a really, I had a really big spiritual experience during my birth of my son. His name is Blake Blake Moon. And um, so prior to that, I told you I lost my mom and I didn't deal with her grief at all. Um, I think I kind of just went into like regular life, um, cut out my emotions. And um, eventually it took me at least like six years of therapy, honestly, to kind of just deal with the, her passing. And while I was giving birth, um, I had this moment where I had a flash, a vision of myself in my mom's apartment, literally going through her stuff like a robot, like, yep, keep this trash, keep trash, keep trash. And then seeing myself in, um, therapy. And I had this like overwhelming, like, oh my God, it took me six years of therapy and I was very nervous of holding my son uh, when he was born um, because he was he had passed. And I realized, okay, no, I cannot go through 10 years of therapy. I have to deal with this. I have to get, get past of death and give him the love that he deserves and for myself as well. Be in that moment because I might regret it. And so there was that experience, but also I asked the questions to the doctors, you know, I was like, okay, what did I do? Is it, did I, is it my Pilates? Did I eat sushi? You know, I had like one or two sushis. Like, is it, is it me? Did I do this? And every single doctor, every single nurses that came in, they literally just really made sure to tell me this is not your fault. 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 And having gone through grief with my mom, and I also lost my brother um, when I was um, seven years old. So, unfortunately, I have experience with grief. And yeah, I was like, okay, how can I learn from these moments? How can I learn from these experiences and not do more pain to myself? we can like really just stay in the dark and the pain from losing someone we love. And the healing is already so immense that I really wanted to find an easier way to get through this. It's like, I just, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. 
Like, no, I, I am sad for the reasons that are in front of me, but I'm not going to dig into the things that I, like you said, I can't control to make myself even more miserable. Like, I mean, how yeah. do you survive, you know? That's the thing. I, some people either don't survive or they survive through more misery and just, and then just going through it even harder. And I, I just was watching, uh, there's a show called The Leftovers. I don't know why I have to reference it so specifically, but there was a scene in the movie, that, uh, the show, that was, I don't know what, this guy was going through something and I'm, I might be butchering this, but he was saying, does this guy choose to see his suffering through anger and resentment or does he choose to see the suffering as a blessing? Mm. And I, I, re I really see those two paths and it's much easier said than done. I think it's easier to be angry and resentful and, and and whatnot. And I truly think it is harder to take that path of seeing it as a way where I'm going to learn from this. And it seemed like you applied that so well. It's amazing. I, I didn't know the rest of your story and how much loss you've already experienced. So and not that it makes loss any easier, but it does seem like it affected the way you cope with it. So mm -hmm. how, is, do you explain it the same way you just did for people that, that have experienced something like a, a stillbirth in that haven't experienced loss like you have, because I'm sure there's plenty of mothers and women that experience that type of loss without having experienced grief so intimately like you have. So right. do you give them that same message? Like, how do you explain it to someone who doesn't have the experience like you have? Yeah, I think I'm a little bit more gentle with, especially right. <laughs> with the guilt side where it's like, I, I definitely give that validation um, because it is natural to have that guilt. So I think for someone that goes through a stillbirth, has their first grief. Um, you know, there are stages of grief that I think you just have to go through. And my main, you know, advice for anyone that's grieving is to go through it. Um, because that's when things become subconscious and just way more difficult to handle when they come up as triggers. And then it's just bigger than anything you can handle. And that's going to happen even if you go through the stages, even if you feel it. So that's already hard enough. But, you know, I, I ha I've had some mothers who have gone through stillbirth that are like, Julie, like, I'm sorry, but I really can't wrap my head around not feeling guilt. And that's completely valid. But I think there's a healthy level where it's like, how much, um, how much are you willing to um, to give more pain to yourself? Like, right. how true is it that you should carry that guilt? Like, if you really, really, um, in the most logical and way, with a very logical situation, looked at the facts that you should feel guilty about this. You cannot find any of them. Mm. So I think it comes with an exercise with step-by-steps of, of, of seeing the truths and not just letting high emotions um, get to you. And it's hard right. and it takes, it takes a while. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's not, I think there's feelings of – honestly, whatever you feel and it's, in a lot of situations, I think it's natural – um, but the, the guilt is definitely easier said than done. Are there any situations where a, a stillbirth or something of this sort is, has been caused? I'm sure there obviously are situations where it maybe could have been preventable. Is that exist in this situation or is it, or is this rare? I think that, um, you know, uh, obviously if, uh, if a mother is very much abusing of, you know, drugs and alcohol and just being unhealthy to a whole other level, then yes. I think that absolutely can cause a stillbirth, but we also have seen tons of mothers, <laughs> you know, yeah. doing those things and still having a mm. baby. So it kind of like also depends on, um, on your morals and values while you're pregnant. You know, you can't really like push too much on a button and see what happens and then be like, Oh, whoopsie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah, no, but I was just curious because the, 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 yeah, the only reason I was asking that is because um, I was just trying to look at both sides of the shoe of how you're in a situation where, you said, like you said, you're, you were asking those questions because you were concerned about was it something you could have done differently and they are factually, objectively saying no, 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 which helps in the case of getting over the grief. I just wonder from the perspective of a mother that actually happened to do one of those things that 
probably shouldn't be doing that could have been prevented. Yeah. That's like a, that's like a whole nother aspect of the guilt where it's like, oh shit, okay, you I know, could've, you could have done, yeah. you could have done something. So actually, yes, I feel like sometimes um, the doctor doesn't take it as seriously as he should on some, may, perhaps signs that could be alarming. And because we live in a country where we have to advocate ourselves so much that if we don't know certain things that a doctor tells us that they're kind of concerned about, then you might just trust and go home and then, yeah, realize that, yes, it could have been preventable. And, you know, doctors kind of rely on a a protection law where most of them don't really get snapped on their fingers if they miss something. Um, and you know, it actually just happened to my neighbor very coincidentally enough who, um, moved, um, literally a month later that I moved and I was pregnant with uh, my rainbow baby. So rainbow baby is the baby after, uh, a loss, Mm. um, which we can get into, but yeah, I never heard that. Um, she was actually at a risk of a stillbirth. Like what? How, how is that even possible? It's so crazy that we were both in that, you know, moment. And she told me that her doctor told her that she was at risk of a stillbirth and sent her home. And I, from my experience was like, excuse me. I was like, no, you're going to the hospital. You're going to get like monitored. And I think I came from a place where I was really pushy, but also didn't want to scare her. But um, so long story short, you know, she was able to save the baby. And um, it was actually a really good thing that she went to the hospital because they ended up inducing her. And thank goodness, because my heart could have not handled um, a preventable loss at that stage. She was like, you know, nine months pregnant. Uh, no, so I'm sorry. She was, um, eight months pregnant. Um, so yes, in some cases, unfortunately, I think that if you are concerned and if your doctor is just kind of concerned, but not giving you enough information, I think it's completely okay to act like a crazy pregnant lady and go to the hospital and be like, I'm concerned look into it or go to your doctor, advocate, advocate, advocate for yourself. If you have any doubts, it does not matter what the levels are. It doesn't matter if you're like going in your head of being like, oh no, I'm kind of crazy. Honestly, that's what I did. And even though in my case, it was not preventable um, because it just happened really quickly. um, I learned that when I went with my instinct, I was so welcomed from the nurses of like, absolutely, sweetheart, please come, please come. And it took me hours, hours of going around in my head of like, oh my God, I have a bad feeling. I have a bad feeling, but I'm going to look crazy. And Mm. so that is one advice that I would have is like advocate for yourself and go in, go in to get checked if you have to. Yeah, I love that. I mean, especially uh, intuition goes, especially you know, women. I feel like women are so much more intuitively inclined and are probably more right than often more than wrong. And there's a book I read called The Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And once again, I'm probably butchering another scenario, but I want to say it was the, I think it was Outliers. Oh, shit. It might have been one of his other books. Anyway, he was talking about the situation of uh, like co pilots or something of the sort that of, of historically when they listened to the black box, knew something was wrong, but they didn't say anything out of fear for kind of talking to the person that supposedly knows more. And maybe this Mm. is a bad kind of connection, but I'm just saying like, when you hear a doctor tell you something, they're the expert. So you, it's like a weird feeling of, like you said, may think I'm crazy. What do I know? But I think, I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing advice to kind of just, if you have a, this is your child in this situation, just I'd rather look crazy than, than not look crazy. I'd rather look crazy. hundred percent. And the medical system is desensitized. It just is. Doctors are just, you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, I mean, I'm not too concerned, but, you know, these numbers don't look right, but go home. (laughs) It's like, "Ah, I don't know about that. Like, uh, no, that doesn't feel good. So Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. I mean, I get it. They're seeing a lot of people. They have have a specific job, but there isn't, you know, there isn't a, a secondary level to that. It's like Patch Adams where I had that more emotional connection with his patients. 
And as, as opposed to like most talks where it's just very black and white, which I understand I and mean, they you can't really expect them to do too much, but at the same time, you know, there's different levels to that, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Agreed. Um, yeah. So it's, so you said I'm interested in the, the layers of, you know, dealing with how you dealt, it seemed like you dealt with grief at different, at different points of your life and how you dealt with each one tended to evolve. So losing a child, like in this manner in general is such a different process. So where were you in that, in that evolution of maybe that like first year to the growth? Like what have you, what have you seen as yourself in dealing with that? Like, obviously it's never going to go away, but have you, what are like the longer term methods or contemplation or however you got through it? Like what are some of those ways that you're still dealing with it? Um, so for us, um, oh, so, you know, stillbirth is like, it's such a, I always say it's such a complex grief because, um, it's a grief that has, it's a grief that is the start with life. So it's just so uh, mind boggling, especially when you don't know anything about it. I really felt like I got hit by a truck, like 800 miles per hour. And I'm pretty good at creating worst case scenarios in my head. (laughs) But this one, I did not create it. I had didn't even think about it. So when it happened, it was really like, I, I mean, to be crude, I didn't even, I didn't even know that babies can die in the womb past a certain like month. I had no clue. I thought I was in like high risk pregnancies for me. It was just, I felt like just taken back. So the shock was like just so insane. Um, and because it's like, you know, a baby that you didn't really get to know, and you had all this projection of your life. One of the things, you know, with um, my fiance, the father, is um, that came up right away for us. And we did feel guilt about it was like, okay, when can we try again? Like, this is obviously a child that's irreplaceable, but we still had these projections of growing our family. Um, I have a five year old that, you know, was waiting for that baby. Um, so, one of the first questions, you know, that we asked our doctor was when is the possibility to try again and what does that look like and what does that mean um, in health aspect and also in the grief aspect. So I had some guidance in, in at least looking forward to that, but at the same time being completely terrified. Um, so what I did was I really worked on the grief aspect Um, I worked with the therapist. I did EMDR because I had really, really intense panic attacks. Um, and I eventually decided, huh? EMDR. Sorry. I'm not, what is EMDR? Oh, really? So EMDR. I don't know this. Yeah. This is great. Uh So no, it's awesome. Um, so it's, a, it's, <laughs> so it's a therapy that, I mean, I'm probably going to butcher this as well. Cause I'm not like, you know, a therapist, but, um, so it's a therapy that, um, recreates paths in your brain to desensitize the really intense emotions of that trauma. Wow. So basically through, um, some of them are from tapping or lights where like a different flicker of lights or like, you know, they'll do something with your finger and you have to follow and they ask you questions about your trauma and, um, until that trauma, each little bits of it is desensitized every time you talk about it. Mm. you are healing. And so it creates new uh, path work in your brain to just feel better about that trauma where it's not like a huge trigger because so when something very traumatic happens, we can, our brains can only allow us to think about it for a couple seconds until you're kind of like clench and you're Mm -hmm. like, Oh no, 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 no. I can't think about it. 
And that's a Got protective. It. That's our innate, like, that's a natural thing that happens. But the problem with that is that we're not healing. And if anything happens on the outside that triggers you, like, a scent or like, you know, when I saw a pregnant lady or anything like that, anything that would um, trigger that particular trauma, then you're going to relive it. Right. Um, so EMDR just kind of makes you like, okay. Okay. And it's like, it's subconscious. It's, um, it's really interesting. It's intense. Because bet, it yeah, goes through say- like every moment. Yeah, I was gonna say it sounds it definitely those neural pathways are definitely deeply ingrained subconsciously and we don't even realize those are there some of the time. So to tap into that, no pun intended. But I've heard of the tapping though. Um is it, what is that specific the tapping technique is called something specific. I'm actually sh- frustrated that I don't understand what it's called, but I've heard about the tapping. So I've heard of this technique, I guess, but I just didn't know what the hell EMDR was. So that's that's cool. So you said you sorry to interrupt what you were saying about how you got through this stuff, but that was obviously one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a tapping technique that's more like to calm yourself that you do it like, you know, like this on your forehead and then like that, like there's certain points. That's more to also probably, but you can do it to yourself. A therapist will do the things to follow and they'll tap you. Um, But so, yeah, so that was one of the things that I did and just lots of therapy. And, um, and then I feel like my past griefs were kind of like almost like a, you know, like, uh, going through my own, um, learning course of like, okay, so what did I not do? And what did I do to get, o- to not to get over, but to survive, um, mm. these emotional, very heavy griefs with my mom and my brother. And, um, I kind of just went through it. Like every day I just honored, if there is a day where I just wanted to cry all day. I did. There's a day where I felt like smiling. Um, I did because I remember, you know, when my mom died, the first few smiles, you know, you're like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm such a terrible person. I should not be smiling. No, my mom died. My mom died. No, like, no, I'm in darkness. This is horrible. I miss her. It's heavy. But the problem is that grief is forever. I mean, you love that person for the rest of your life. You're going to grieve forever, just at different levels of, of intensity. Um, but the first waves of grief and the first moments are absolutely excruciating. I mean, there's no, I, I don't even know. Listen, I was so in, in a fucking didn't know what the heck was happening to me that even on the urn, I, I, I wrote the wrong year. Okay. Oh, I literally didn't even remember what year my son died because I like when I sent it over, I didn't realize because he passed away in February. I didn't even realize that January was already a new year. Yeah, it That's does that. how in a different like, whew, like, oh shit, he passed in 2022. I forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know where we go. I feel, I feel like that. I mean, that makes sense to happen. Sometimes I feel like you're just, I don't know if it's just we're not present. We're so distracted. We have a million different thoughts, a different feelings, but like, I mean- I don't know if it's a, it's a lack of being present or just distracting. There's just, you're just completely overwhelmed with emotions, but I, I get yeah. that. I just, you just, I just don't feel. Yeah, it's here. a good question. Where do we go? Because don't you feel like the world goes around and you just kind of stop? Yeah, like, it's like there's you stop living. Like it's you like just those stop. movie scenes. Those movie scenes where like I feel like like if someone's walking down the streets of Manhattan and everyone's like going a million miles an hour in a blur and you're just kind of like in a daze walking through a crowd. That's kind of what it feels like for me. It's like it feels out of body sometimes and just. I don't know. It was. It's been a long. It's been a long while for me. Um, but it's. it's I mean, it's super personal. I'm, I've been going through a breakup, and this has nothing to do with death, but a breakup and a, lo- a, a losing someone through a relationship. It's grieving in so many it's different grieving, ways. I'm yeah. Like, and I'm not comparing it to actual loss, but it feels like actual loss. And that. And I'm bringing this up because it's the most recent type of grief that I've had personally, mm-hmm. and, um, and having that. You said the pain that you just mentioned that you feel. It's like it's just an, such an inward pain that I'd rather get stabbed in the friggin' chest. You know, like yeah. that the physical pain and the internal yeah. pain that you feel through trauma doesn't compare. And it's very bizarre because it feels yeah. everlasting and evergreen that it's just like, and you can't dig it out. It's unless you, and the only way to dig it out here is to dig it out here. And that's a process. Right. 
and you can heal it. It's not like you have like a outdoor, outdoor, um, outside, you know, scar or anything that you can put something on it. It's inside. You can't like, Oh, how do I heal this pain and breakups? Oh my God. Breakups are, yeah. I've had my fair share of breakups too, before I met my forever. Um, and breakups Mm. suck They're Yeah. And they're like in your everyday, like, you know, it's, it's not only grieving, but it's also like, it's a whole new world of habits. Um, Exactly. But I mean, that's grief in general. And, 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 and on the topic of relationships, um, one thing I did want to ask you in regards to, I feel like a big, a big association with losing a child is, you know, the continuation of a relationship besides the fact you, you know, have want, want more kids or someone has other kids to take care of. It's that continuation afterwards through that relationship. And I feel like maintaining that relationship through the grief can be such a challenge in itself. Yeah. Um, luckily, you know, um, his father, Kyle is, was, um, so strong, super supportive in his own way. We didn't grieve the same way. I think that's also, that can happen with stillbirths where the man, you know, doesn't grieve, um, as much as the woman at first. Um, because a lot of fathers kind of wait for the baby to be born. So there's like that, you know, lapse of, of, um, of emotions, which I think are supernatural and we can't hold a man, you know, like be mad at them for that. But, um, he had so much strength and, um, he really carried me for a while until his grief hit later on in a very sudden way. Um, but the hardest was also with our, our, our little boy, um, who's five now, but he was four. Um, and that was very hard. You realize how much they understand. That yeah. was really heartbreaking. And, um, I eventually got pregnant with, um, Zoe, my daughter, that's now five months. Um, I got pregnant with her rather quickly. I got lucky um, within like five months of of losing Blake. And mm-hmm. um, so that was like pregnancies back to back. Like they would be wow. Irish twins if Blake was alive. Um, so it was very hard physically. But honestly, it was my only way to to do what I felt like I had to do as a mother for my family, I felt like a vessel, like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to do this. We're just going to try again. I'm going to hope. And I'm going to, I felt numb for nine months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it was the hardest nine months of my life. Um, and I didn't work as much on the stillbirth because I didn't want to have too many emotions during the pregnancy. Um, and so now it's, it's, there are a lot of weird things that are going on where grief is hitting again and where I realized that I kind of had a detachment with Zoe because I was so numb and so out of body during these nine months that when she was born, I almost had this moment of like looking at her like, oh, wow, where'd you come from? Like, how did you get here? Cause it was just so like crazy. Like, Oh wait, I was pregnant for nine months. Like <laughs> right. it was, it was just very, um, it was hard. It was definitely really hard. Yeah. To say um, the least. And I, and I think, I don't know, maybe you just go on cruise control at that point. And you know, that's, that's what we talk about the subconscious. I think, you know, our subconscious, uh, I had this amazing guy, I don't know if you know him, but Bruce Lipton on my podcast. And he's always one of those guys that mentions how 90, 95% of us were controlled by our subconscious mind. And um, that's kind of like the autopilot. I mean, that's what controls our, our, our inners and why we breathe and how uh, these things function without even thought. It's our subconscious mm-hmm. mind controlling this stuff. And um, I don't know, I feel like we just go on autopilot sometimes. We're still able to function. We're still able to do things. It's like getting in a car and driving somewhere and you driving. zoned out. And like, yeah, it's like I just drove two miles. I'm like, I just missed the exit, but I don't remember driving. But yeah, but that's – and then your body can't operate on that autopilot where you're just not consciously thinking about these things. And sometimes I wonder how much of that is a 
defense mechanism or is it us just like you said, where do we go? Um, right. but you were still, you still able to get, continue on in life even through that. But eventually it catches up if we don't, you know, kind of handle our shit. Yeah. Eventually so. it catches up. So now it's catching up to me for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. you seem super aware. Like, you seem super yeah. aware. Um, definitely catching up to me in ways that I didn't expect. Um, I also have, you know, I feel like now I feel more of the guilt of not thinking of Blake as much as I did when I was, you know, just grieving him and I didn't have, you know, our baby that we had prayed for so hard and he's irreplaceable. And I have so many moments where I'm like, you know, I, am supposed to have, I was supposed to have that little boy too. And I really identify as a mother of three, but it just really, there's times where, you know, going back into the newborn days where, you know, when I'm holding Zoe or when she's crying and I'm soothing her or like different things of taking care of her, where I'm so triggered that I'm not taking care of Blake. It's like, oh, I should be doing this for my baby boy. Um, And now I'm really learning to feel okay and safe to get attached to her. Um, Because that comes with a lot of fear too. Where it's like, okay, so where, how, how do I get attached to you without this immense fear? Yeah. Um, how do you? I mean, I think you just, I, I think about that. There's so many, when, when, when some, yeah, you just do it. I mean, you just like, like when shitty things happen and it's easy to replay things. What if, what if, what if we're storytelling creatures. So I just want to constantly think about the, all we have to like, for some reason have to think about all the scenarios. And then sometimes we're in a vulnerable state. You want to obsess about their scenarios that don't even, aren't even so. Obviously, right. you may have an experience, have an experience that might justify that because it's happened. But I don't know. A lot of fear is doing things that haven't even happened. You know, sometimes it's from fear because it's happened, and that's a whole other thing. But um, I don't know. It's just letting go, and letting go is much easier said than done. Um, yeah. know, I don't have an exact play. I don't have an exact playbook about it, but I think a lot of it is just quote unquote fear and flipping. So what's the fear? You flip it to the opposite side, which may be a better outcome. And just, just as much as you can think of a shitty outcome, you can think of, of a, a better outcome. outcome, you know? And it's sometimes that perspective and the way we look at things is so powerful, way easier said than done. But I think, you know, through repetition and just really contemplation and going through it and feeling it, you know, at some point, sometimes, sometimes it clicks and it will click. Yeah. And we all, we all go through our shit in different ways and different timelines. Like, you know, you right. feel in the guilt of, I didn't do this at that point, but you know, it happens when it happens. So, yeah. And you know, know, to, if, to your point, and if that makes anyone feel better, um, like you said, how many times you think about something and it never happens. And, you know, like I said, I was a great, like, um, worst case scenario that never happened, but I never thought about the stillbirth. Mm. So it's, you know, it's not a thought that I put out there. It's not my worst case scenario. It happened. It's very mm. shitty. It's horrible. But I, it's not like I, I manifested it. So a lot of times when, yeah, you can think of all the shittiest things and it, it might not happen to you at all. Most likely yeah. they won't. And a lot of things is just, you just don't control it. Yeah. And then if it does happen, well, shit, you didn't deal with it then. <laughs> it's like, like, it's like, with putting so much stress and fear on something that hasn't happened. And then when it does happen, it's like, okay, well, you just doubled up. Well, well, it might as well just like, okay, shit, maybe it'll happen. If it happens, then figure it out. Then we'll figure it out. But in the meantime, it hasn't happened. It probably won't happen. But I'm not one to say, oh, it's not going to happen. I don't know. Shit happens. Shit <laughs> happens. Know? So shit that's happens. it. Forrest Gump. And I think it really also, the, um, it's, it's those moments where you – also see your surroundings of who's there for you and who understands you. And I think like, that's just why I love your podcast because um, for grievers, the hardest part is to not be able to talk about their grief experience because people are so uncomfortable from it, but that's how we heal. And I feel like we live in a society with health and wellness where they make you think that you're going to live your whole life. Like, hello guys, it, there's death. There's life and death. Yeah. Okay. Like we're all going to die. That's going to happen. So why are we pretending like it's not? And that comes with a certain behavior. 
of a lot of people Mm -hmm. where you tell them like, you know, that something happened to you. You know, my father died in 9-11 and they're like, okay, so uh, Uh, what uh, time do you want to work? Wait, I just. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that, that's so why I bring. Like, that's why I bring up the humor part. It's like I, me personally, my way of I think it's a coping mechanism, and I enjoy it, is is humor and cracking a joke in this situation. Because like I, like how I, sometimes I know I, I, it's dark humor. There's a reason for it. I understand. Like we said, starting off like want to be respectful. Sometimes I I don't want to be respectful. It's just like what the fuck are we doing? Like it's like it's life. We don't, we don't know anything. Sometimes we can't take ourselves too serious. Obviously I need to feel out the crowd and I don't, I'm not going to be disrespectful to someone else. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. It's funny. I, I think, I don't know. You, you got to face it. And that's one way I like to face it. And, um, like you said, it's a, it's a conversation that I think is extremely important. And I'm not saying we have to think about death all the time, but when you do contemplate death and hear stories like yours, it makes you rethink life and, in so many ways. So it's just, yeah. it's a conversation about death, but it really is a conversation about life is what I always say. And you know, yes. what you're going through and how you're flipping it and being such a resource for other people, other mothers is tremendous. And, um, you know, I commend you for that. And I want to thank you for doing what you do. Cause it's like, even though we've had totally different experiences, it's easy for us to conversate about something like that. Cause way different. And, I, in so many ways, not for better or for worse, it just sucks at the end of the day. But like, I don't know, there's that connection. It there sucks, but talking with you like is this. healing, you know, and it's, um, it's also like a healing journey for me to be able to be here and talk about it openly and you hearing me and, and you hearing so many other people that you have on your podcast. And, you know, they really say that even if you go to a grocery store and you just mention something about your loss and the, the cashier just looks at you and genuinely says, you know, I'm really sorry for your loss with emotions, that little moment is healing. Mm-hmm. And we just have to be a little bit more open We with these, all of our stories that will happen to all of us at some point at certain different levels. Um, yeah. I think it's like, it a, takes time. It takes time. Yeah. For some people to open up and I, I want to shake people to open up, but I was also that person that didn't open up. So it's like, listen, at your pace, but I'm just letting you know, listen, I don't know the right answers about anything at all, but you'll feel better. You, you most likely will feel better and, and, you know, take it, do what you got to do. I'm not here to, if people aren't going to, people got to make their own decisions of, to make a change. Like you could hear it Mm -hmm. one ear, it can go out the other, like you got to make the decision. So like, I know at this point, the conversation is a release of energy, whether it's death, loss, job, this or that. It's the reason why people will have a chatter or chatterboxes. Like if it's a vent, it feels good. And I think, um, 